In this video, we're going to take a look at two-tailed tests for two sample means where sigma is known. If you'll notice, I did not include that summary page like I usually do. Um, again, because a two-tailed test is the exact same summary page as the one-tailed test, so we're just going to go straight into an example. We have two universities in the same state are rivals about everything. Each university believes that its students are more physically fit than the students at the other university. To test the claim that there is a difference, so difference is what tells us that this is going to be a two-tailed test because it doesn't indicate a direction. In the average fitness levels of students at two universities, 36 randomly selected students at the first university were surveyed and found to exercise for a mean of 2.9 hours per week, a random sample of 38 students, at the second university was also surveyed in this group and found to exercise for a mean of 2.7 hours per week. Mean two. Assume that the population standard deviation for hours of exercise at the first university is known to be 1.1 hours per week and the population standard deviation for the second university is known to be one hour per week. We're going to use a 90% level of confidence, which means alpha is 1 minus 0.9 or 0.1. So again, what are the hypotheses? We have the null hypothesis is that mean 1 is equal to mean 2 or that mean 1 minus mean 2 is equal to 0 because there's nothing that says they should be any different. We're assuming that they're the same. The alternative says that there is a difference. So a difference just indicates that they're not equal. So either M1, mu1 is not equal to mu2 or mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero. So again, the hypothesized difference is zero. Check the conditions. We are given that they're both random samples. We are also given both sigmas and both uh, sample sizes are greater than or equal to 30. So conditions are met, we can move forward. We've already talked about the null and alternative hypotheses. Now let's do the math. So the test statistic again is just subtracting the means and then minus the hypothesized difference, in this case is zero, and then divided by the square root of each standard deviation squared divided by n and I end up with 0.817. The critical value for the rejection region, remember it's two-tailed. How do I find the critical value? Well, if alpha is 0.1, remember for a two-tailed, I have alpha over two over here, and I have alpha over two over here. So that means there's 0 0.05 in each tail. So I can either take norm s inverse of 0 0.05, but that's going to give me a negative value, or norm s inverse of 0.95, either one, because there's 0.95 to the left of the value. And then again, for the p-value, this is the one that gets a little tricky, because what I have to do is I have to find a p-value for this area and to the left, and for this value and to the right. And remember that both of those values are the same, and that's where that two times comes in. And because my z-score was positive, I'm finding the area to the right and then times two. If my z-score were negative, I'd find the area to the left and then times two. Or just use Excel. Draw a conclusion. So again, p is greater than alpha, and the test statistic is not in the rejection region. Uh, I don't know if I drew that out, but we can see 1.645 would be further to the outside than 0.817. So with P greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null. Remember, we always talk about the alternative. This indicates that there is not sufficient evidence at the 0.1 level of significance to say that the mean numbers of hours per week students spent exercising by students at the two universities are unequal. The confidence interval is found, again, using the critical value. 
And so we already have the 1.645. Remember, this is just x bar 1 minus x bar 2. We do not include a hypothesized difference. In this case, it wouldn't matter. But in our last example, it should have mattered. And then we end up with 0.2 plus or minus 0 0.403. And then notice we end up with 0 in our interval. So when I'm writing my conclusion, I'm saying what the interval means. I'm 90% confident that the mean number of hours per week students spent exercising by students at University 1 is between 2.3 hours less and 0.6 hours more. So I want you to notice, even though this value is negative, I didn't put the negative in my sentence. I said 2.3 hours less to 0.6 hours more than the second university. And then I talk about the hypothesized value. Since the hypothesized value of zero falls in our interval, this supports failing to reject the null. And again, let's take a look at how Excel can do all of that fun work for us. I strongly encourage you to do that. I'm still using those same inputs, the mean, standard deviation, and sample size for the first sample and for the second. Don't forget the hypothesized difference and then alpha. Same z-score is just the z-score formula, so I'm taking the first mean minus the second mean minus the hypothesized difference, and then divided by the square root of the first standard deviation squared divided by n1 and the second standard deviation squared divided by n2. For the critical value, remember, we're just taking norm s inverse of alpha over 2 or of 1 minus alpha over 2, Again, those are the two critical values. I honestly want the positive one to use in my interval, so that is why I've chosen to use 1 minus alpha over 2. For the p-value, again, different ways that you can do it. This is using the if-then. Um, if you've been watching the last videos, we also talked about how to just use the right-tailed value, so to use the absolute value to make the z-score negative, I'm sorry, to make the z-score positive, find the area to the right and double it. So whichever way you do it is fine. I'll just leave this up here for now. What this is saying is if the z-score is negative, I'm going to take two times the left-hand distribution. And if it's positive, I'm going to take two times the right-hand distribution. And again, those values just came from the left-hand distribution and the right-hand distribution. So again, remember you can use norm s-dist, or you can use norm dist with 0 and 1 as the mean and standard deviation. It's the same thing. Point estimate, same as it was before. First mean minus second mean. And E is the same as it was for a one-tailed test, except that I have to use the 1.645 critical value instead of the 1.282. And then I get all of the same values. Again, point estimate minus E, point estimate plus E. And if you compare to what we found by hand, those values are the same. Up next, we're going to look at section 11.2. And 11.2 is about two sample means with sigma unknown, which means we're going to be dealing with t-scores and the t-model. Um, and remember, there are two different scenarios. There's e unequal variances and equal variances. So I've just split it into two groups, unequal and equal and we'll do as many questions as we can for each one in those videos.